All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Um, it's 1 p.m. here Eastern Time. I am uh, delighted to be here. This is our second panel conversation uh, from the On the Road or NCIHC On the Road um, conversations. We are going to be talking today about training clinical staff in communicating effectively across languages and cultures. And just a couple of um, reminders or, or, or notes. You can use the Q&A chat um, to type any questions you may have. We also have the chat feature if you want to make any comments there. But please um, add your questions in the questions chat or the questions tab that you have in your Zoom menu. Um, we're going to be talking with a panel of experts in this topic and we have many questions and I'm sure they have very interesting stories uh, to tell us. So we apologize in advance because most likely we won't be able to answer all of the questions that you may have. But this uh, panel conversation is being recorded and is going to be available um, and post it on the NCHC website. So look for that after, several weeks after <laughs> this panel, okay? And um, let me tell you a little bit about me, um, Tatiana Sestari. I am humbled and honored um, to be here today to moderate this panel conversation with wonderful professionals. I am a nationally certified healthcare um, interpreter I'm also a pharmacist and a pharmacologist. I serve in the NCHC on the road work group, which is the group coordinating this event, the policy education and research committee. And I'm also part of the NCHC board of directors. So I'm very much involved <laughs> with many initiatives here uh, with NCHC. The other hat I wear is uh, director of language service advocacy at Marty Biop Health which helps me leverage my passion for language access, best practices, research, and of course, supporting communicative autonomy of all, okay? So I am here surrounded by wonderful people. I'm very excited to, to have them here with us. We have Laura Holcomb, we have Kelly Matthews, and Avlo Kessa, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I'm sure they have many, better ways to talk about themselves than, than I have, okay? So if we, um, if we can start, uh, maybe Laura, if you can start, please. Of course. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. I'm Laura. I'm joining you all from Guatemala City, where I'm based. I grew up in the United States, um, in the South, in fact, in Georgia. And um, my beginning, I began my career in interpreting in the halls of hospitals. Um, so, um, my, my interpreting heart is, is definitely rooted in healthcare, but since then I've gone on to, um, study a master's degree in conference interpreting, where I also did healthcare in court coursework, and then had the distinct challenge and privilege of teaching for that alma mater and coming up with an online practicum for healthcare interpreting, um, students who had completed their coursework. So we'll dive into that a bit later, uh, but but that's me, a couple of different hats, uh, trainer, healthcare interpreter, conference interpreter, and then also a lot of um, tech planning for online and hybrid events under String and Can Multilingual Online, which is, which is the company that provides services. Um, yeah, I'll hold there and then We'll get into some others as we, we talk more about the topic at hand. Yes, thank you, Laura. Yeah, I, I've known you as a person who wears multiple hats, <laughs> that's for sure. Thank you for being here, Laura. Kelly, if you can please introduce yourself. Yes, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. My name is Kelly Matthews, and my background is mostly as a social worker as well as public health researcher. Uh, today, my role is outreach coordinator as well as senior research coordinator for the National Center, Deaf, National Center for Deaf Health Research, which is based in Rochester, New York. 
Our center focuses on community-based participatory research, CBPR for short, and we use that approach with all of our education and training activities. We are funded currently by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we are one of their prevention resource centers, so we partner directly with the community, the deaf sign language using community, as well as the hearing loss community. Uh, interpreters play a very key role in our work, obviously to help facilitate our communication for our team. Uh, so I'm just very excited to be here to talk more about how we provide training to medical students. So I'll talk more about that later. Thank you, Kelly. We'll, we're thrilled to have you and um, share different perspectives uh, during this panel. And last but not least, uh, please, Avlo, if you can uh, introduce yourself. Me? Thank you. Uh, my name is Avlo Kesa. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm an interpreter by training. Um, I work with Cambridge Health Alliance. I'm the, uh, the program director. My department is called Multicultural Affairs and Patient Services. Whenever I mention the name of the department, people always wonder what do we do in that department. So we do a number of things with one goal in mind, to provide the best care for our patients. So I oversee uh, language access. We also oversee inpatient transport, volunteer engagement, and the information desk. Um, I have been here at CHA for 27 years. I never get bored. It's always another exciting day to come to work because I'm surrounded by a great team of interpreters. And I, so I, I value the work and uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk about what we do in the area of training here. Thank you so much, Avlo. This is, uh, I'm very excited to, to hear your stories and oof, with that trajectory, huh. I'm, I'm very thrilled to have you here. Um, just one uh, housekeeping item that I uh, forgot at the beginning, and it's about our CEUs. We will not be offering continuing education units for this uh, panel conversation, um, but you are more than welcome to um, you know, review the recording later, and if you need any information, let us know, okay? All right, so we are here. Um, and um, as I said before, I'm sure you have many interesting stories. And I, let, let's start with that, because I, I want to make sure our audience knows what you've been up to <laughs> in regards to uh, the topic we're talking about, training to clinical staff or um, administrators in hospitals. So my first question to you, either one of you, actually all of you, I would like all of you to answer is, um, please give us a brief description of the programs you've been involved in. Um, Cause I know you've, you've had the experience in setting up programs for instruction or have trained healthcare staff about providing effective language access services. So if you can please give us a little, uh, a brief description of the programs you've been involved in. And uh, we can start with Kelly this time. Great. Yes, thank you. So our program actually started before my time of working with NCDHR, but um, we have been coordinating this in partnership with the medical school for the last six or seven years now. So our program is where we provide a one day, full day interactive activity, and we call it Deaf Strong Hospital because our hospital is strong hospital. Um, so it's the University of Rochester Medical Center, but the hospital is called Strong Hospital, Strong Memorial. So that's why it's Deaf Strong Hospital. And the day long event includes a lot of prep work beforehand, many months ahead of time, because what we do is we have our Rochester area community members, the deaf sign language users, we hire them and they become our actors for the day and they are assigned specific roles throughout the hospital as, you know, hospital staff to act as them. So it's really a role reversal. The medical students become patients. 
Um, it's a little bit of a culture shock for them in this activity because before they start, what we do is really the day before the event, we go to one of their seminars and we explain what's going to happen the following day. And we also ask them to not wear their white coats on the day of the event. So that already sets up, um, you know, a bit of their understanding that this is a role shift. So we ask them to become a patient at our deaf strong hospital. Now each table we have, we have lots of different areas set up like offices and everything. It's all done in sign language. No one is speaking at this event. Um, and the group is actually split into two separate groups. We've got different paths that our patients can take through the hospital. Uh, some start with a diagnosis as the first step and the students will read a card telling them they need to go to a specific area of the hospital. They go there and if they successfully navigate that section, then they go on to step two where they get a different card and that leads them through the whole scenario. However, there's a lot of different experiences and frustrations that the students encounter because this is a complete role reversal. It's not in English, it's all in sign language. So if, for example, they're waiting in the waiting room and they have to wait for their name to be called, but their name will be called in sign language. So we do have some students who don't ever realize that their name has been called we give them an ABC card, um, but they don't always recognize that their name was spelled. Uh, we do have some students that just end up being stuck in the waiting room all day because they never realize that their name was card called. Um, and that's a real life reflection about what sometimes happens to people who don't speak English or deaf people um, in our medical system, unfortunately. So they get those types of experiences. We have deaf doctors and deaf pharmacists, again, actors in different areas. Um, and there is uh, one tract of patients uh, that go through where the doctor actually encourages them to sign a consent form so that they can move on to the next step. However, that consent form, I forget, uh, we have it in multiple different languages. It's not in English, so they can't understand what they're signing. But the actors who are playing the doctors and nurses are very encouraging that you need to sign this form so that you can continue throughout the process. So after that activity, uh, after it's all done for the day, after they go through, actually, let me clarify real quick. So there's the group during the simulation itself, it gets split into two separate tracks, but then everything gets into two separate tracks. We've got the medical center or the medical students, there's about a hundred of them. So while one group is going through the hospital simulation, another group is receiving a lecture about deaf culture and the deaf experience in healthcare. And now we've recently added, um, we have an MD PhD student who leads that lecture, who is deaf, which has been an awesome addition to the event. So after all of the activities are done, the, the seminar and the uh, experience, there's these debriefing sessions that are co-led by a hearing individual as well as a deaf individual. And um, those debriefing sessions are really the opportunity for them to reflect on what happened during their role reversal experience and to see how they, um, understand what folks are having to go through. And we tell them like what they consented to for one, um, <laughs> one of our consent forms actually says you agreed to have your hands cut off, but obviously not in English. So <laughs> they, they get really shocked when they realize what they signed. But it's, again, it's an accurate representation about what people are experiencing in the medical field and that we're asking patients to sign these papers that could have life or death consequences that they don't necessarily understand what they're signing. Um, and one part of Deaf Strong Hospital is where we will have interpreters provided in a certain section of the hospital. So when they actually get to that area at the psychologist's office, a lot of them have a sense of relief that finally I can communicate in my primary language. Um, and so we try to show that's the same, that, you know, deaf people have that same feeling or, you know, non-English speakers have that same feeling when they finally get access to interpreter. So we feel that this role reversal really gets people to fully understand 
that the world that they live and navigate through is not the same as others. And it helps them to keep those types of experiences in mind for their patients. Sorry, I know that was a bit long, but I tried to summarize it best I could. No, I was about to say wow, but not because of how long it took to explain it. Just wow, based on the experience that uh, your program is uh, making others go through and that role reversal um, experience, as I said before, is just mind blowing. Um, as a, as a, not only an interpreter, a language access advocate, but also as a pharmacist and a person who has taught different levels and different types of uh, degrees in the medical field, I can see how that is very impactful to the students and any other healthcare professional involved. So thank you so much. This was great. Um, all right, Avlo, can you tell us a little bit about your program? Great. Well, uh, at the Cambridge Health Alliance, we try to use a proactive approach when it comes to um, training providers and staff on how to work effectively with interpreters and, and, and how, is, how essential it is to provide um, language services for our patients. So my department, I lead the linguistic and cultural education team. It's a team of two people. Uh, but I, I, I realize that we are omnipresent. Uh, we are present in, at new employee orientations. We, ha we, ha we have about 45 minutes to talk to new employees, clinical or, or, or non-clinical, about the importance of language access, about the legal requirements of language access, and also about how essential it is to provide language access if you want to deliver the best care possible. I, I never encountered a provider who's not well-intended, who, who doesn't want to provide the best care for his or her patients. But you can only do that if we can communicate at some level. In addition to that, we also present at new nursing orientations where we, you know, we, we talk to our new nurses about language access requirements and how to connect with patients um, across cultures. We also um, have a platform where we meet with our new medical residents. You know, the rotation is every year they come in and then they get to um, work with, with our department on best practices. We also touch psychiatry uh, residents on how to work with interpreter services and how to provide care that um, patients can perceive as culturally appropriate. I tell provider, it's not about you. It's not about how you perceive the care in your own lenses. It's about the patient, how the patient experience the care. And in addition to that, we get a, we, we get a platform at our cultural um, psychiatry seminar where we, um, we get a chance to meet every year with our uh, psych residents to give them an overview of our patient population, who we serve. Uh, and we tend to focus on our three main language of care, uh, which is Portuguese, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. At, at, at the Cambridge Health Alliance, 44% of the patients that we serve need an interpreter in order to communicate effectively with their care provider. So if you don't do that, if you don't provide them with an interpreter, if you don't provide them with a provider who can work with an interpreter, they're not going to have meaningful access to their care. And that would be a disservice to our patients. So in a nutshell, that's, that's our program. In addition to that, we also use a, a reactive approach. So we ask to be invited at any department uh, where there is a need to continue this conversation about language access, about providing care that patients can perceive as culturally appropriate. So we, we, we touch every department. Now, in addition to providing training for our providers on how to best work with interpreters. We also help our own staff. We have staff who's, um, who have difficulty in English and they are, they are very effective. They are part of our workforce. They are mission driven. So there are times where we need to provide interpreter services to those staff so they can access some of our programs. Wow. 
now I, I now I understand exactly why you said omnipresence or that you're omnipresent because your your range is very wide and um, I really like that. Um, thank you, Avalo. Sure, um, sure. This is this is great, and and you also touch um, different levels of preparation uh, with with the staff. Thank sure. you. Sure. Yeah, this is this is wonderful. Yeah. So at New Employee Orientation, um, you know, somebody who's who's coming to work here as as a financial analyst or as an IT expert, you know, may wonder why do I need to listen to Ablo? First of all, you don't have yep. a choice; it's a requirement for employment. But but you go in your own area, you're going to be designing systems that will affect our LP patients. So it's important for you to be aware of the implications and what it means to be an LED. Yes, and, and I, I noticed you you mentioned something that to me is key, which is patient experience. And part of it is, you know, doing the right thing and, um, and all that, but also a good part of that is realizing that patient experience is um, a key aspect in, in you know, in, in the quality measures that are utilized to evaluate hospitals and health um, centers. So I, I, I think it's important for our audience to think about that, okay? Um, all right, Laura, if you can please tell us a little bit about the programs you've been involved in. Yes, um, I love going last. This is really, really impressive. Um, what I'm going to describe is a little bit the nature, the nature of it is a little bit different, the setup from what Avalo and Kelly have mentioned, um, though they've both inspired me to, to this is great uh, energy, food to feed kind of the, the work that I do. Um, I've developed a bit of an expertise in setting up peer to peer experiences. And so um like I, while I listen to Kelly's, it's so intentionally aimed at creating uh, a powerful experience for um, medical professionals or student professionals. Uh, and that's that's the ex the exclusive intent of it. Um, and there's all these wonderful collateral beneficial side effects. Um, and then Avlo has the institution who's really focused on the patient care aspect of it, the patient experience, and then using that to um, feed the communication of an entire institution of which interpreters are a key, a key element. Um, what I do is I bring professional interpreters together with student doctors or student healthcare providers, um, not, not in the hospital context to create what we call an online simulation lab. It's like, um, it's like as if providers were in the simulation lab, but now um, their patients are not English speaking. And it's an opportunity for students to get an early experience with what working with an interpreter might feel like, what it might be like, what are the advantages, what are the challenges. Um, and, and so from the provider side, I love the fact that we get to work with medical students, right, before um, as kind of a foundational experience. Um, but it's less focused on creating any sort of explicit training for those students. It's more like um, these, these professional interpreters, we both need each other, right? Everyone needs each other. The interpreters, we need you students and your expertise to get better at our craft. And students, we need you interpreters to understand better the intent, the, 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 how you best do your work and the advantages that it can bring to the interaction. Um, and so to give you a rough outline of the structure, uh, it we run this as a three-day intensive. The first two days are consecutive rounds with, um, which in spoken language interpreting is, is a mode that's very often used in healthcare interpreting. So uh, provider speaks and then 
uh, interpreter speaks, patient speaks, and then interpreter speaks, right? Not simultaneously. And then the third day is focused on healthcare appropriate simultaneous and getting into the simultaneous sandbox. Um, those first two days, we structure it. So we have round after round of consecutive simulations, different diagnoses for each round. Um, and over the course of those two days, we work with 150 medical students that come in and out of our, our Zoom doors. So logistically, it's pretty, it's a pretty intense logistical exercise, but we've now we now have a good model for it. The students come in pairs. And the interpreters go in pairs. And those interpreters know ahead of time um, when they will be tasked with interpreting. And again, a role reversal, when they will be tasked with playing the role of the patient um, who may have who has some sort of limited proficiency, possibly language marginalized background. Um, so it's a different role reversal. And I find as an interpreter a really fun, they have to create. Um, what we call personas. So uh, I'm I'm this individual. This is my name. This is my age. These are my beliefs about healthcare. Uh, this is the country of origin that I'm from. This is why possibly I am in, for example, the United States or Canada at this given moment to really create a a practice worthy environment for everyone involved. Um, and the interpreters getting to recenter themselves in the shoes of the patient. I find it serves a a, a very important logistical function to make the simulations work, but I also find that um, they 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 recenter us as interpreters in our in our work and help us refine the micro decisions that we make as we interpret. Um, hopefully, in the name of communicative autonomy and language access. Um, yeah, so that that's how the simulation works. It's called it's called SimLab Lab Seven, and it's a continued partnership with Marion University. And then we also have professional healthcare interpreters looking for a high level practice lab, and then we also have student interpreters who have just graduated and are new to the field. So a whole mix of experiences, uh, of academic backgrounds, professional backgrounds all coming together to hopefully create um, an environment that then leads to, again, it's so key, the debriefing element. Then there's a provider debrief at the end of the simulation where everyone gets to digest the experience. Interpreters get to ask those key medical questions that we may not get to ask in our day-to-day -day work. Um, you know, like, well, well, why is it that steroids are often prescribed in this certain circumstance or, you know, um, whatever the, whatever the, the, the questions we don't get to ask as interpreters, um, in our day-to-day -day work. And then students get to reflect on the challenges and the rewards of, of working with interpreters. Thank you, Laura. This is so exciting. I would have loved to be in one of those <laughs> labs <laughs> as an interpreter, as a provider, as a patient, all of the above, actually. You're um, welcome anytime. Oh, thank you. I, I'll, I may contact you. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I really like uh, the fact that you mentioned uh, that you have a different approach uh, compared to our, or your program has a, a different approach compared to the other panelists. And that's probably the reason why you're here today. <laughs> and um, because we want our audience to listen to all these stories, all these different um, approaches and ways to help um, because any way we can help with a training and advancing language access, I'm sure, you know, it's valid. And, and I'm sure many people are taking notes uh, about these ideas. Right. Um, I'm very excited about situational learning uh, experience, as you were saying, that that is key in in this profession as an interpreter is also key in many healthcare professions. So I'm sure this is this is a great opportunity uh, for whomever is involved. So with that, I wanted to to talk a little bit about um, 
something of course related but I like to believe that you know when it comes to language access in healthcare there's a consensus on the importance of educating all the parties involved as we've been talking about and we can even say it's the right thing to do but have you had to play the card of education and training our regulatory requirements like have you had you know have you found any walls limitations obstacles so that you've had to play that card and anyone can can answer <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, ours is pretty straightforward. It's really credit. Everything I'm saying, um, if anyone out there knows Liz Essery, I'm just saying what she would say. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fraud. I'm Liz. Um, Liz was really the one who put in all of the work to get the this course is part of these medical students curriculum and when we talk about this is not regulatory at a at a joint commission sort of level this is regulatory within their academics they have a interprofessional uh training requirement and so this check we this checks that box for them so in that way um yes making sure that this is part of it's part of the medical students curriculum. And then the Glendon um, recently graduated student interpreters are, are recently completed their, their coursework. They're not quite graduated. It's part of their requirements as well. So I, I do think that's helpful. And then there's the, the, you know, the lifeblood, which is the larger professional healthcare interpreting community in general, which is a really important link between these different groups. And um, I see we as panelists, we don't have access to answer directly out to you all. So I saw a question real quickly that I'll answer coming in is, can this model be used ab at, with other hospitals? Absolutely. And there's not enough of me to do it. Um, and so that's another, another thing we love to have um, healthcare interpreter trainers or other people who are interested in training and education come and I can show you as much as you're willing to tolerate of what happens behind the curtain and you can apply this model um, anywhere and, and everywhere. Thanks, Laura. So here in our case at the Cambridge Health Alliance, it's the right thing to do. When we look at the makeup of our patients, we need to make sure that we um, leverage training for providers. Um, you know, in, in addition to the requirements by uh, the Department of Public Health and the Joint Commission, for some reason, the Joint Commission is always interested in our uh, language access program when they visit. They always like to talk to interpreters. They always like to uh, do chat with you. Um, so it, it, in addition to being the right thing to do, the hospital leadership has a vested interest and they put a lot of resources in making sure that our program uh, is, is running. It's also effective for our patient population. Um, our CEO is a big, big, big fan of language access. Um, he's, um, he's an immigrant himself. And he said, you always say that, you know, when, whenever he's in meetings, he can pass for a non-immigrant until he opens his mouth. Thank you. That's interesting. Kelly, do you have anything uh, that you would like to add? Yeah, so how our program started really was from a group of medical students who themselves were requesting something like this. This was back in the 80s, actually. Um, I'm sorry, the interpreter misspoke, the 90s. Um, so it originated with them. And what happened is that the students were noticing Rochester has such a large deaf community that they wanted the medical school to provide them with some sort of curriculum so that they could better understand how to work with the deaf sign language population. Um, so I believe over time, those students, you know, phased out, graduated, moved on, did the residencies, and our center decided to become the formal, you know, host um, with the medical center as well, the School of Medicine and Dentistry, so it became part of their curriculum. Um, the other activities that our center does and that the university does, um, the university is very committed to providing 
equal access um, linguistically, not only for patients, but as well as the deaf professionals and students who work and uh, learn here. Um, and I, I should also mention, we do have other spoken language interpreters as well. It's not just the ASL. But I do think that it's a combination of being able to work with the community, um, you know, serve the community of patients as well as the people at the medical center um, who are em employees, but also doing the education for the people who are providers and who are going to be exposed to different types of of languages and get them used to that before they go and start their careers. So I think this has just become more of a norm here to see interpreters or see different types of languages being used. Um, it's just kind of become part of our culture now. I love that. That is, that is great. Um, I know all three of you are involved in uh, programs that have been very successful, but for those um, in our audience who are trying to develop something or who are still, you know, fighting to, and I'm, you know, I say fighting, um, to get uh, some of these types of programs or anything uh, regarding training to hospital staff up, you know, they, they're just starting to work on this or they have been trying to convince people what would you tell them? Uh, how how can they convince university or hospital leaders to dedicate a portion of the training curriculum um, to language access and learning to work with um, the different communities that um, may need interpreting services or language services in general? So how have you maintained the program over time in light of competing institu institutional priorities, because those are definitely some of the um, struggles uh, people may have. Um, and we can start with Kelly. I think uh, there's two thoughts I have on that. It's helpful to get input from the students themselves who are actually paying for the education, right? So they have a little bit of weight in saying what they want to learn about, because um, that's their tuition dollars, um, and that they know that they need to be exposed to the different communities that they're going to have to serve. My other thought is to connect with local the local community who might want to show to the hospital leadership, or you know, they could talk about the disparities. They could talk about how things aren't currently working for them and that the hospital needs to do better. So you can use that community's voice to advocate for that sort of change and, and make that a priority for the leadership. That's very interesting. I really like that aspect. Um, I will say though, that we still need those who are also spoken language interpreters or those who are more familiar with um, treating or um, servicing um, individuals who um, are hearing may notice that they're not as empowered here in the United States to advocate for themselves as other communities such as the deaf community is because I'm I'm amazed as at, at what the deaf community has been able to 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 gain and, and to like all that uh, progress that has been made based on that ability, that empowerment. Uh, so th that's food for thought. I, I just wanted to comment on that, but I really like that perspective. Thank you, Kelly. Um, let's see, uh, Laura, do you want to share a little bit? What suggestions do you have? Yes. First, I just realized I shared, we shared an, I shared an expired link to the course. So let me dig around and get the correct link and I'll repost that. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I was talking to Liz, my partner who runs, who runs this online simulation lab with me. And, you know, she did a lot of work with the buy-in on the, on the provider side and getting it into the academic curriculum. And at the end of the day, she said, and I, I think it reflects what Kelly says, um, she said, you know, it's not very sexy, but it's kind of plain old relationship building. Um, 
And I think that's what Kelly is referring to as well. Like, who are the stakeholders? Who is it for? Um, let's let's hear let's hear from them. So that's one side of the relationship building. And I think probably it's it's things that Avlo is doing in 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 his work, as in being out there, being visible, being being present um, with the people that uh, you're intending to work with, uh, you know, not always hiding in the language services offices, right? And I'm, and I, um, I know that that's something I recognized, I think, is, is, is prevalent in, in kind of the, the Cambridge model. Um, and then finally, just making it easy for the people that you're working with. There are so many, a lot of times, it's not because people don't, aren't concerned or don't want to learn. It's a lot of competing interests out there. And so um, making it as, as easy as possible, lowering the barrier of participation, making it as easy as possible um, to come and have the experience and do the learning, uh, I think is, is key to, it's probably why we, for example, get we keep getting asked back to work to work with the medical students over and over again. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I've looked. Anything you would like to add? Any suggestions for those who are trying yeah. to start programs like yours, for example? Sure, sure. Any suggestion? Any secrets? I think one of the um, the trick that's really worked for us is to be able to identify champions, and you you know. Your champion may be an executive. Your champion may be a, uh, a clinician who really buys into serving LEP patients. And, um, and I also want to piggyback on what Laura said, relationship building. Relationship is key. You know, making contacts, be out there talking to folks from different departments is also important. Um, I, I, that, that's how my, my leadership style is that's how I measure success. How, how do I relate to people that I work with? How do I relate to people to whom I need to tap into to make sure that I get the program running? I, I, I think that's, that's also key for us. And what um, we have done too is to get interpreters involved in the training and presentations because they are major stakeholders. This work is also about them. And um, you know, it, it can impact them in a positive way and a negative way. So I, I always like to um, have an interpreter partner with me whenever I'm going to talk to a group of clinicians or, or nurses. Perfect, thank you. And I hope people are taking notes because these are great uh, suggestions and advice from our panelists. Um, I want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time and I want to, if possible, um, I have one more question. Let me just say this. I have one more question, and uh, then I'm going to ask one of our wonderful support individuals, Eliana Lovo, to help us with some of the questions we have in the in the Q and A um, tab. So my last question is: What changes, if any, did you make to your uh, provider training program during the pandemic, or you know what impact did the changes have on the provider? or trainee experience? Uh, did you have to change the, the training delivery uh, mode? Um, you know, going from maybe synchronous to asynchronous or in, in person versus remote and all that. What uh, can you tell us about that? What changes did you have to make or did your program ha have to make? Anyone? I'll go. So no, knowing that, um, you know, and human being can adapt to changes. So we had to adapt to changes very quickly and COVID didn't give us a choice. Um, so uh, in terms of the delivery of our services, it wasn't difficult because we were all, we were already operating in a remote fashion where about 85% of our interpreter encounter are conducted remotely. So only 15% in person. So, and we, are, we were also able to deploy most of our staff interpreters to work from home. From a, from a training perspective, uh, we had to move from an in-person platform to a Google Meet platform. And um, we, we, we adapt very quickly. 
uh, as COVID has put a lot on display uh, for every one of us to see. So we were um, we were early adapters in that regard. Perfect, thank you. And I'm sure you had to also adapt some of the ways the training was, I mean, not only the delivery method, but also, you know, how to make sure people were engaged or, you know, to make it interactive, right? Yes, and that wasn't too difficult for me because um, I, I'm a big fan of interactive learning. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's quite, it's a tall order to keep your audience engaged in the, in, in the, in the remote format. But um, I have been successful in doing that. I use a lot of humor and I get people to participate. Um, before I even start, I tell them, this is your training, this is your presentation. And I'm only here to facilitate this conversation about language access and, and, uh, and cultural humility and healthcare. So um, I have been successful so far as far as um, keeping my audience uh, engaged and interested in the topic of language access. So, that is wonderful. Uh, Kelly or Laura, any changes uh, that your program had to make? Mm -hmm. Yes, I guess I should clarify that for our Deaf Strong Hospital event occurred fully in person. And so unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to postpone for the last three years now. We were not able to host it. And so our goal is to host it again in 2023. It usually happens in August so that the first year students are exposed at the beginning of their first year experience. And so now since COVID, we've been discussing if it's possible to provide programs to other patients and students in other places who want to be able to use some version of Deaf Strong Hospital in their area as well. And we're welcoming that. And we're also welcoming observers so that they're able to host the event for themselves because it's really an amazing experience. And to add an extra layer of complication. When we were in person with masks for the deaf community who relies very strongly on facial expressions and the visual access as well as possibly lip reading, that's a strong limitation that occurred during COVID. And so that made it not really feasible to be involved. And so it's also such a large event that there are so many people who get packed in the room for the event and being in a hospital, it just wasn't feasible to have that during COVID. However, the students in the medical school did still have the option to join a deaf health pathway track as an elective track. And so we are involved with some of that and providing education still about working with the deaf community in relation to health research. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Laura? Oh gosh, I want to go. And it also made me, it's not like I haven't thought about this before, but didn't, couldn't someone have invented clear masks <laughs> for us? That would be, that would have been so helpful. I just think of, yeah, how much, I mean, a necessary evil, but how much is, how, how difficult, how much communication is impeded. Um, and then particularly for some populations, um, but 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 certainly for for ev for every human <laughs> walking around on this earth, there are clear masks. Oh, I want to know where do I get these clear masks? Brilliant. Um, for us, it's so interesting. Um, a lot of my work is online work, and I've developed a little bit of a specialty in in creating peer practice environments online, um, and in training online, training interpreters specifically. And we originally intended to run our simulation lab on site at Marion University. The same, the, our inaugural year was going to be, um, it, it was the same year that it ended up that between the planning of the on site and the execution, um, the pandemic hit. And so we said we need to move this online. And so we got busy doing that. And to to be truthful in hindsight, um, I actually think that the it, it would have been an impossibility. If the model that we had would have been an impossibility to do on site at that time, at, you know, for the particular circumstances we had set out. Um, 
because it is powered not only by the medical students, but by professional healthcare interpreters um, who it's very difficult for professional healthcare interpreters to take longer amounts of time off from work, to travel to a place to get training that's not going to result necessarily in a concrete certification or some other um, huge credential. And so that was kind of a gross misestimate on our part. And we have the pandemic to thank for actually having saved that first um, that first uh, that first session of ours. Now, if you have a situation where you're in an institution and you have a body of medical students and you have a ready body of interpreting professionals, that's great for an on-site sort of thing. Um, but what I really love about the online format, it obviously has its drawbacks, but what I love about the online format is that we can bring in, we end up with interpreters on, from different continents um, who really bring in their different experiences, the different ways that healthcare interpreting is approached in their regions uh, of the world. And, and that's very enriching for all of us as well. So yeah, we, we had to adapt, but it was for absolutely for the best. Um, though I'm not in fan of, I have another peer practice intensive I run on the conference interpreting side that I made the deliberate decision not to take online. So it, it's not like I'm just a wholehearted, like, yes, put everything online. It, it, it does have costs, but it can work really, really well for certain um, certain needs. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and again, diversity in approaches. And I think that's, that's uh, the beauty of this panel that we can, our uh, audience hopefully is taking some of these, many of these ideas uh, to probably uh, put them in practice. Um, and um, I, since we still have a few minutes, I would like to see what questions we can answer from the audience. Yes, I've been collecting them furiously from both the chat and the Q&A. And the first one is a comment that I'm going to share with everyone because it's important for your voices to be heard. This was shared from Joanna Ramos in Washington State. There's a good opportunity right now to elevate the issue of the need for training of students and providers in comments to HHS for the proposed rule on ACA section 1557. And it's important to note that comments are due by October 3rd, so that window is closing. If you want assistance with submitting those comments, National Health Law Program has created really excellent resources and templates that can be customized with a dedicated template on language access in healthcare. She posted the link in the chat for more info, see www.healthlaw.org, and then we're to get the templates for everyone. It's important for all of the opinions and learning that we have shared today to be communicated. Best practice can only be improved if we can get some of this codified into law. That's my comment. Now, we've got over 30 questions for me to pick through. So let me go quickly with, from Susan Greenblatt, have any of you worked with dual role interpreters, employees with another job who are called on to interpret? I know we did at Harborview and we required them to be independently assessed for language proficiency at a specific level. And the buy-in was very slow the first year, two MDs, but it quickly ramped up as soon as people got a small pay differential for being identified as a dual role staff member, allied healthcare worker, doctor, or nurse. So Susan says, I've trained a group of dual role interpreters in education and in healthcare, but not in hospital. What are your thoughts? So I, I don't have a thought because um, we, um, the hospital, uh, we, we operate in a union environment. So the union would oppose to the idea of um, staff having dual work. Do we Anyone have any, else care to weigh else? in? Yeah. 
because at Harborview, interpreters are also part of the union, but we did make that work with both dual role uh, allied health care and interpreters by prescribing that dual role staff could only provide service as part of their regular job in another language. So you can't poach the phlebotomist to go into a pediatric clinic and interpret for a peds patient. She can only interpret for patients in her regular blood drawing uh, job responsibilities that speak the language that he or she have been assessed in. No other comments? Okay, I'm gonna to move to another question because we got so many. Um, what about training for non-clinical personnel and personnel who may be first point of contact? Yes, that first point of contact and the phone tree are where we still have a lot of people falling through the cracks. Is there a different training approach? And that question was from Don Welshman. I actually need a repetition. I'm sorry. Can you read it one more time? <laughs> sure. I got to find it again. What about training of non-clinical personnel and personnel who may be the first point of contact? Is there a different training approach? I might say from my perspective, no, not necessarily. The way it's set up is as a peer practice intensive where everyone is learning from each other. And the same model could be used um, for non-clinical professionals and I think is equally uh, important. It raises a good point. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the mix, um, although people may consider non-clinical things not as high stakes. I know I certainly, as a healthcare interpreter, spent um, a lot of time with non-clinical staff, and the, and the communication is, is just as, as worthy of support, I think, in those, in those contexts as well. And I want to say thank you all for the clear, clear mask tips. I know that hospitals have their, you know, that's a different, that's a whole nother beast, right? Um, as far as the requirements and, and the, the approval, um, you, you all got me thinking my here in Guatemala, kids are still in masks at school and, um, there's a lot of language learning going on at the age my kid is. And so, um, I, anyway, that's, that's, that's what had me interested in clear masks, even beyond, uh, our work as, as interpreters. So um, at the Cambridge Health Alliance, we capture the non-clinical staff at new employee orientation, uh, where we focus on the importance of language access. We focus on you know, the, the, a good introduction to the patient. We also focus on giving the interpreter time to process the information and, and, and interpret it. As we know that um, interpretation requires a lot of mental energy, that, um, you know, that linguistic conversion from one language to another taking into account all the nuances. So this is my, you know, so this is what I, you know, I, I tell uh, new staff to really give the interpreter uh, time. Uh, as we know that mental energy is available in human being and limited supply. So it's really, really important for, um, for the interpreter to have time to be able to um, do the work. All right, thank you so much. I don't believe, yeah, we don't have more time uh, for questions right now, but I'm sure we'll, We'll come up with maybe a way to uh, have those some of the questions that were asked uh, with some answers posted in a similar way to uh, what we did with our first panel discussion. Um, so you will find that information on our NCHC website, which is ncihc.org. And uh, well, I hope this conversation has been useful uh, to our audience. It's it's been such a great learning experience for me. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic and this is something I do or I, I work on almost every day. And um, please uh, remember that this is being recorded. The video is going to be posted on the NCHC website and is free uh, for anyone, for all to access it. So make sure you go back to it and spread the word about uh, this recording and also the other on the road uh, 
panel discussions that, that we already have there. Well, with that, I would love to um, say thank you. <laughs> this has been such a humbling uh, experience. Thank you, Laura, Ablo, Kelly. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you to all of you backstage, um, Vanessa, Amy, Eliana. Uh, we couldn't have done this without them. So I appreciate everybody's time and I'll be safe out there. Thank you so much for being here. Goodbye.